Let's start back. So we got about the first eight pages done last time. We had a, a very unproductive session, which I'm currently editing and is a complete fucking nightmare. But so let we got as far as here. We got the last table we did was we discussed this like, concept of rationalized and non-rationalized social relations. Oh, dear God, that one. Yes. <laughs> so now we're getting on to the central meaning of class to Weber. If you have your books out people and participants it's basically halfway through the first paragraph on page 29 that's where we are okay so according to weber class is class is defined in terms of the economic opportunities people face in the market it's simultaneously a definition of class in terms of rationalized economic interactions and class for Weber is a description of the way people are related to the material conditions of life under which their economic interactions are regulated in a maximally rationalized manner. Finally, the emergence of a rural proletariat thus represents the transformation of forms of access to material conditions of life governed by tradition to one governed by calculation and pure economic interest. That last point is interesting because it rhymes with Robert Brenner. Yeah. Um, you know I was thinking that, right? Yeah, I knew. I was like, I better tee this up for Esri to like. But like, it is interesting because in England, it is like the end of the peasantry and the beginning of a rural proletariat and wage labor in, the, in, in agriculture is like really is the beginning of capitalism in a way that leads to industrialization. So that's. And like Weber's not off, like you could be a Marxist and come to the same conclusion pretty easily. Yes, when we you are say, dealing with just such Marxists here. When you said, Esri, that this was, yeah, you were just going to say this about Brenner, expand a little on that. Brenner is responding to what he sees as a continuity between Marxism and Adam Smith, where you have this sort of like teleology of commercialization. Whereas like Brenner is super interested in how. In, in first of all, in defining capitalism, essentially in terms of like um, a market situation, he does this rational choice rules of reproduction to, I think it's to define capitalism. He uses rules of reproduction to define capitalism. And he really is very skeptical of some kind of grander historical causality bringing about, bringing about capitalism because when you look at the intentions of all the actors involved, like you had a ruling class that for a while really had stakes in keeping things the way that it was. And you had a sort of deliberate political project, which is why this tendency is sometimes called political Marxism, deliberate political project to marketize and to kind of redraw the incentive structures. I guess a proper Weberian would say that before, you know, you didn't have like these incentivized rules of reproduction and that they get invented here. I guess that would be the difference between Brenner and Weber here. This one here where this point of Weber's work, he describes class as a description of the way people are regulated to the material conditions of life under which their economic interactions are regulated in a maximally rationalized manner. Like, I want to hear somebody go off on this. <laughs> Who wants to go off on this point? Like, that's quite a claim that it's maximally, maximally rationalized to have like workers and then parasites. Well, but rationalized is, I, it's not just ideologically, but the ideological point is familiar to Marxists that instead of the great chain of being determining your ascriptive group or something, you have a sort of humanist ideology that guides a reason themed structuring of the economy. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Reason yeah. here is, is post hoc. It's to justify things that already exist as opposed to it being the arbitrary capricious will of God or whatever. We're now arguing for efficiency being the reason why we are organized in such a way, but the old power relations, according to Weber are still basically there. Um, and that's why Weber like ascribes a whole lot of causal power to Protestantism as the rationalization mechanism for a lot of things that used to just be like, God says so, shut up. So rationalization does not mean rational in like even an economically optimal sense. 
except from the perspective of those who already have power, i.e. the capitalists and the aristocrats who depend on them. Yeah, in the same way that the U.S. rationalizes its behavior overseas and at home. Post hoc justification of systems of power that need to now be argued for instead of just claimed are uh, perforce natural. Yeah, so it's it's not that electric of a claim if you're thinking of it that way. Like, there is an element of Weber where, like, you know, there are traditions that are torn up and there are, like, it's not always the old power relations, but it, it sometimes is. And that's what makes this, I think, not just an ideological claim. So, like, certain types of status groups will lose their status because it doesn't fit into the new model. Right, yeah. Anybody else have anything to say here on this page or will we go on to the next slide? That's it. Dialectics. Dialectics, you remembered. Okay, so this is two more of these points. Um, first one is, this is on a continuation of the central meaning of class to Weber. It's possible to achieve a higher level of economic rationality if management has extensive control over the selection and the modes of use of workers. And the central theoretical problem in which the analysis of class and the transformations of class relations are embedded is the problem of rationalization of the economy. It is a very, uh, I don't know, what would you say? Bureaucratic or something is the wrong word. What's the word I'm looking for here? I don't know. Yeah, I hate Faber. I hate, I hate this shit. <laughs> like, I hate this idea of, like, uh, you know, like, it's the first point here is extensive control of the selection and modes of use of the worker. So a, a higher level of economic rationality, that kind of folds away so much, doesn't it? I know we've done some stuff on exploitation in Weber, but that hides a huge amount of other things. Well, there's a reason why Weberians focus on management so so much if you're gonna talk about people who have managerial theories of capitalism as opposed to ownership theories of capitalism they tend to folk they tend to come out of the viberian tradition or the james burnham tradition or both and what's interesting about that to me is weber sees himself as describing a tendency that was related to a monopoly capital so he's not even that deviant from social democratic concerns in the right. early 20th century. Like this is consistent with Hilferding too. Mm -hmm. um, that the abstractification of capital ownership will require a intermediary class to step in. And that intermediary class has an operant reason to maximize profits and to increase efficiency. Hence the development of a managerial class. The issue with that, I mean, there's many issues with that. One is like somebody's still profiting from this, even if it's abstractified. Like, I will say that if you look at like American culprit structure, for example, there actually is a way in which economic rationality gets worse under abstractified capital versus old like singer ownership capital prior to the limited liability corporation. And one of those is like you have a legal duty to your stockholders formally to always turn a profit, whereas like theoretically an entrepreneur could break even for as long as they had reserves um, if they had a social reason to do so. And some did. Um, it was rare, but it did happen. Now, ultimately, that's not economically rational and um, capitalism would break down if everybody did it. So you disincentivize that legally. And so, like, there are things that Weber is coming out of. If you look at the, the this transition from 19th century capital, you know, like, like pre-long depression capitalism to more modern capitalism, he's got some kind of point. But it also, where I agree with you, Tom, it obscures a whole lot. Because this is like a capitalism, not only without capitalists, but seemingly with the profits being, I guess, somehow shared or something. And that's not what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just like exploitation in general that seems missing from Weber. It's also this like extractive view of profits, it seems like. I don't know. I kind of don't remember all those other like Weber quotes that we were reading back in the part of the chapter where he's like, well, I mean, Marx and Weber, they're not that different in some ways. Um, I guess we're actually getting to the convergences here, aren't we? Yes. 
But yeah, I don't, obviously this chapter is called The Shadow of Exploitation. So many of the things that should bother us about Weber are encapsulated in that concept. The thing that doesn't bother me about Weber is the way that it shows that rationalizing bureaucracy and capitalist relations are essentially one fist of modernity. Um, you know, I think those are the more interesting analyses, especially when our politics is like market versus state or something. And it's just sort of this dance of like, I'm pro market, I'm pro state. And I don't like the market, I don't like the state. And so any kind of critique gets wedged into that collapsed discussion. Um, if you can identify those things as more or less two sides of the same coin, and I would say that they are especially because the most elaborate attempt to create a bureaucratic state in this fashion without capitalism just, you know, had to turn to capitalism, you know. I think it's interesting that, like, for example, um, the Frankfurt School picked up so much for Weber, because when I think about the dialectic of enlightenment, it sounds like a highly mystified uh, and focused on ideology version of this point, that the state as a sorting apparatus, as a highly rationalized sort of apparatus, and the market of a highly apparatus sorting apparatus would both have a tendency towards bureaucracy in similar ways because they're interested in the same kind of instrumental rationality. What's missing is the whole profit motive for the whole thing. But like, it also makes sense of like why Marx was so insistent, particularly in the days of the first international, that we not forget that the state had a class origin and could never be seen as neutral, a la the Lasallians are most Leninist now, a whole lot of MMTers, et cetera, and so forth. I uh, just wanted to say that, like, you know, there is that market versus state conflict, but I don't think, like, taking the Weberian point necessarily implies any kind of critical perspective on this stuff, because the centrists would agree, oh yeah, the market and the state are the same. They're, they're both, they both just, they just work together and it's just a matter of tweaking the knobs and that's how you get the best capitalism. So that kind of Weberianism also exists out there. Yeah. Not every Weberian is like Foucault, but then again, not every Foucaultian is like Foucault. I was about to say, I know a whole lot of Foucaultians who seem to read like the Panopticon chapter and like beat off to it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Weber was conservatizing, you know, from, you know, whatever high point of radicalism or something he had in the SP day. I'm using radicalism relativistically. Um, so, yeah, this is the vo a voice of resignation in a way, but like when thinking about class as it is, it's helpful to put those things on the back burner. But when I think about the monopoly capital theses and the financial capital theses around Hilferding and around like classical social democracy in Germany, though, it is amazing how much it does sound like just changing the word highly effective capitalism to highly effective socialism and replacing centrist Democrats with centrist social Democrats. And like, it's the same thing. That's the project. That's the goddamn project. It's um, that's funny now. Uh, just remembered there when you were talking that when I first started getting into Marx, I was back in Dublin and I was telling a, a friend of mine, I said, "Oh, I'm reading Marx, I'm reading Capital," and he was going, "Oh no, man!" He says, "You need to have you finished Capital? You need to read Max Weber, man. He's fucking, he is the real deal." And uh, you know, my media actually is an Ulster Protestant, so it, <laughs> looking back, it makes so much fucking sense. <laughs> <laughs> I rationalize how we own the land. I rationalize it. Oh, fuck's sake. Forgot about that. Um, that's too fucking good. Too fucking good. Um, I won't say who he is in case he listens. Okay. Um, we go on to the next slide um, where we're getting into the similarities between Weber and Marx on class. Who wants to take this one? Esri, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. So... Weber and Marx on class similarities, relational rather than gradational class concepts, not primarily identified by quantitative names like upper, upper middle, middle, lower middle and lower, identified by qualitative names like capitalists, workers, debtors and creditors. The centrality of property relations, 
Property ownership is the fundamental source of class division in capitalism. Propertylessness is essentially a coercive condition. Voluntary interactions of the market are simply a formal reality, masking an essentially coercive structure of social relations. We go on. Yeah, we go on. I think we'll go through them, yeah. Classes as places versus class as collective actors. Distinction between classes as objectively defined places and as collectively organized social actors. Class situation versus class in itself. Class conscious organization versus class for itself. Classes and material interests. Objectively definable material interests as a central mechanism through which class locations influence social action. Material interests are seen as a determinant, albeit a probabilistic determinant, of their behavior. Weber also thinks this material self-interest would be more important than ideological commitments in a socialist society. Yeah, we'll stop there. We'll We'll stop. Yeah, we'll stop. (laughs) I always sign up to read a slide. I think it's interesting that Weber uses the term class consciousness as the same as Lukash, where Marx doesn't which I didn't realize when I read Weber and read Marx that at the time until I really started looking at the class in itself and for self distinction. So that's an interesting big deal. I think actually they're contemporaries. Marx right. isn't. Right. Um, well, it's also a big deal. Then like Weber realizes that the class can be both things. And I'm going to say like a lot of modern Marxists pretend that the only class that exists is a class for itself. And that the in itself distinction is just, not real somehow and that's bizarre but well, it is that's common like, that's a re-described nihilism like you don't care about the real class like, but it's also it's also top down isn't it it's also yeah. like the yeah. tutorial element well it's not and it's like highly instrumentalizing it's quite disturbing it's it sounds a lot like the right-wing intuitions about this stuff yeah, I was I was going to push back a little bit. I don't think it's uh, so much nihilism as a kind of like misanthropy, but I guess it sort of like comes from the same place. Well, it's politically uh, determinist yeah. to the extreme, but it's also politically determinist in the sense that like the class in itself doesn't become the class for itself. We, the people who know better, make the class for itself exist regardless of what the class in itself wants. Um, and that's that's like a naked power glab. And it's also a way of saying like socialism is whatever the fuck I say it is regardless of anything else. But I do think it's interesting how weird that ends up making every, I mean, like it it does end up making like references to working class, petit bourgeois and all this almost meaningless. Why do you say that? that, Like they're primarily political actors. So their material interests are kind of irrelevant because they have nothing in themselves. They're just forces in politics, right? Yeah. I mean, that it, it becomes like, like, why focus on it even? Like, what was the point of Marxist analysis in the first place if the class in itself doesn't matter? Um, yeah, it's also especially antiquarian now that there's basically no formal fighting proletarian force. So this is a premise in the argument that there is no proletariat. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. so you adopt a framework where it's your, like, it's the meaning of your life is to invent the proletariat. As, in, as, in, as someone who's from a different class background, but who cares about class background? Or who cares about the objective stuff about class? It's all about what you think. Yeah, that, like, that's, uh, that's something that popped up in a lot of uh, DSA meetings back in, 2017 2018 basically like how do we reinvent the proletariat essentially (laughs) and uh right like you can see people spinning their wheels trying to justify like oh uh here's where workers are we need to coalesce them into a class and it's like i don't think that works the way you think it does my dude maybe they're already a class and the thing that we want is like i don't know Maybe we shouldn't use sociological language for it because this is something that comes up on the 
excellent behavioral science podcast, Fight Like an Animal, all the time, is that like real people very rarely are essentially defining themselves by the central issues that the left is like clamoring over in terms of demographics. It's usually much more specified, like we might call consumer identities, but you know, the kind of real things that people get super into and think in their own lives set themselves apart from other people. It's very hard to get them to be like, hey, remember when we all didn't have enough to eat and we you know, thought, thought about things in this other way? Well, we should think like that again. Yes. Um, let's see. Do you want to take the next little section here of similarities as well, Ezri? Or Kyle? I'll, I'll do it, sure. So we have the conditions for collective class action. Uh, what are they, DSA? Please tell us. Uh, maybe we'll find out from Weber. Uh, so Weber thinks the emergence of class associations depends on intellectual conditions, not simply the result of unmediated spontaneous consciousness of people in disadvantaged class situations. Where class structures are experienced as natural and inevitable as absolutely given facts, class mobilization is impeded. The transparency of class relations facilitates class mobilization. Class mobilization is more difficult where there are lots of intermediary classes as opposed to highly polarized class structure. And modern capitalism creates the required kind of transparency for class associations of workers to be likely. So it's all pretty, pretty orthodox stuff. You know, maybe with the exception of the first point, the intellectual conditions being fairly important in the emergence of class associations. So like, if you look at it just from like the economic interest of people as members of a class and then like derive a political program from that as like a likely thing to happen, then I guess you would be in conflict with this kind of perspective where it's like, yeah, no, the, the actual intellectual conditions are quite important as well. Yeah, like the first one doesn't strike me as a similarity, but a divergence from Marx's thought, you would have thought. Mm, yes and no. I mean, it's like the, there is the, a certain degree to which like you get the vibe in Marx that like there's a kind of passing of, of the torch from the bourgeoisie to the working class that happens because the working class is drawn into bourgeois political struggles and a sort of revolutionary tradition comes out of that. So there is sort of a argument for the intellectual conditions being important. But yeah, I would say that he's much less one-sided, much less on the side of intellectual conditions than Weber. Yeah, I think I would agree with you, Tom. But the reading of Marx that Wright is coming out of is probably more like Weber in this way. But I think mm. you're right. You know, it's certainly part of the Marxist tradition. Yeah, I mean, like all this stuff about shaping the class for itself, like you see all of these discussions happening among the Bolsheviks in their like early period of action activity, right? Like we need to invent the the class for itself, all this kind of politically motivated discourse. Um, it's it's there. Okay, anything else here in this bit that, uh, anything surprising here for anybody? I mean, I don't think this is surprising, but like, you know, this transparency of class relations thing really echoes Marx's point about capitalism being the first mode of production where like the history of the modes of production is understandable, right? That point that he makes in like chapter one of Capital, I think, is definitely you see echoes of it here. Yeah, I also think the Weberian interest in private property is pretty significant because when you talk to most socialists today, that is their bugaboo right? It's not abstract domination of capital, or it's not even necessarily the reemergence of class relations in a non-market setting. It's, well, is there private property in it? No? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, for many people, they can argue for, like, state socialism on that basis, right? The government right, is good. which is why we need the tripartite distinction of public, private, and common property. Yeah, and that's also this why... Is, this is my bugbear that I will die on this hill for. Well, I mean, 
a bigger distinction that Marx made was the difference between socialization and nationalization. That's the point he's making, Tiberius is making, I think, Derek. Yeah, but I mean, but public and private and common property is less clear. It's, it's, it's the same point, but it's like property held in common versus property held in public. I mean, I think this did sort of become relevant in the Russian Revolution, right, where there's the debate over, like, should we socialize the land or should we hold it in common among the peasants? Or should we make it state property? Or should we make it, uh, you know, privately held property? Like, all of those things were being debated at that time. When you say the socialization of the land, what do you mean? What, what's in between that common and state property? Well, it's common to society. It's not common to the villages as sacks of potatoes. Bingo. You know? Mm-hmm. As in the village doesn't own it. It's everybody owns yeah, it. Yeah, because in Russia it was common, but it was common to the village. And, you know, it was managed from the perspective of the village, not from the perspective of society. Right. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And nationalization is from the perspective of the nation. The state. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So but you have three different perspectives. And like if you imply common as like local municipal ownership or local community ownership, I actually oppose that. Um, yeah, me too. That's closer to kind of an anarcho syndicalist kind of approach. Our feudal serf kind of approach. Yeah. Oh yeah, let's have it. Let's have it. Tiberius. I assume you're, we're, you agree with your talk about socialization. Yeah, uh, the the commons versus public private distinction uh, it comes out of well, mostly uh, the Western Marxist Lefebvre geographer tradition that gets picked up by mostly like radlibs and anarchists to sort of describe the the way in which both public and private property operate under the same fundamental logic of ownership and domination, like economic ownership and domination. Whereas the commons is a much more, for want of a better way to put it, like egalitarian relational model of property management rather than like actual property ownership. So the commons is sort of seen as a, version of property whereby uh, the land exists, is accessible to all, and it's managed by the people who uh, find use in it by essentially entering into relationship with other people who have either aligning or competing interests in using that property. So yeah, it's basically like socialization. Okay. And now we're on to the last of these similarities. I'll take this one. Um, class and status. The importance of status groups as a source of identity and privilege. Status group impede the operation of capitalist markets. Status groups constitute an alternative basis of identity to class formation. And capitalist markets tend to erode the strength of status groups and their effects on the system of stratification. So there's nothing really to... Did Marx talk much about status groups? It's in the All manifesto. that is solid melts into air. It's in the manifesto, yeah. Yeah, it's in the manifesto. It's implied in the Brumaire, too, actually. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not formally theorized, no. And, I mean, it may have been if Marx ever got to, like, volume five of Capital, where he talked about stuff that... No, but... volume five is the aliens. That's the Posadist one that he didn't get yeah. around to. Yeah. Um, strata and aliens and dolphins. That's the, yeah, volume Those five. Those are the three ascriptive status groups <laughs> and yeah. communism. No, 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 there's also the violin playing dolphins. You forgot about them. But uh, he has a letter to Moses Hess where he denies the existence of dolphins. And then this uh, guy named Mikhail Hinerik, um has come up with a theory of no dolphins in capital. And let's move on. Yeah, there's a theory of no falling violin playing dolphins. Okay, let's go to the next one. Right, now we're going Moving to Moving swiftly Jesus. on from the cetacean ops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some listeners are going to be very confused. <laughs> the truth is out there. I'm going to edit out all the bits of us talking, like, about how they're going to be confused. Just so that they, you know, like, especially if somebody's <laughs> maybe putting on the podcast before they fall asleep. You know, and they're kind it's of your, drifting. And it's the your next full thing is, time. someone's going to write a doctoral thesis. 
<laughs> the no. dolphin debate in marks. Yeah. And then the violins, and they're like, and they're gone. <laughs> Wait, okay. why, do, why do the violin dolphins get a skill rent? Yeah, well, have you ever seen how difficult it is for a dolphin to play the violin? I haven't now, had the pleasure. No. Um, <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, okay, Weber, this is a, we're going to get into the juicy stuff here. Weber and Marx on class, the differences. Okay, nice and slow now, Derek. For Weber, how classes determine the life chances of people. In market society, opportunities are caused by the quality and quantity of what people have to exchange. Access to market-derived income affects a broad array of life experiences and opportunities for oneself and one's family and children. The most important consequence which flows from people's links to different kinds of economic resources deployed in markets is how these links confer on them different kinds of economic opportunities and disadvantages, thereby shaping their material interest. For Marx, the central issue is how class determines both life chances and exploitations. Life chances is merely half the story. Conflicts of interest between classes are not generated simply in distribution, but crucially, also by the nature of interactions and interdependencies generated in production. Exploitation is a social relation that pits the interests of classes against each other, binds the classes together in ongoing interactions, and confers on the proles a real form of power with which to challenge the interest of the exploiting class. The conflict over exploitation is not settled. So you, you skipped... Uh, uh, oh, I what, skipped. I extraction, right. yeah. Just so the yeah. extraction of effort within production is always problematic and precarious, requiring active institutional devices for its reproduction. These can become costly to exploiters. Supervision, surveillance, sanctions, etc. The ability to impose such costs constitute a form of power among the exploited. The conflict over exploitation is not a settled issue in a contract. It continually rears its head during production. The Marxist concept of class directions are directs our attention both theoretically and empirically towards the systemic interaction of exchange and production. Weber rejects the idea that slaves are a class, a pre-capitalist class for Marx, and calls them a status group. Lulls. For status groups are stratified according to the principles of their consumption of goods as represented by their styles of life. For Marx, however, slaves represent a special instance of a different theoretical category, class that includes capitalists and workers in capitalism, lords and serfs in feudalism, and slaves and slave owners and slavery. Okay. Yeah, like slaves are a status group. Do you hear that, everybody? Your special status group. <laughs> oh my God. They're God a status damaged. group because class is defined by consumption, right? That's the issue. And since right. I guess they don't consume or they only consume what's good, I don't know. I don't even know how that works. I'm actually trying to figure my, wrap my head around that. Yeah, I, I have no idea how that works. Although, again, what's most useful to me is thinking of the logic of focusing on consumption as your understanding of class, which is something. Sometimes we talk about in, you know, when comparing like national standards of living, right? Without creating like a, you know, some kind of production circuit or a theory of exploitation, we can see that there's enormous differences in national standards of living, which can, you know, that can be the basis for a sort of understanding that, you know, different nations are of one class and other nations are of the other. This is and, why a certain category of Marxist third world is actually rejects labor theory of value altogether. It's mm -hmm. to hold on to a more Weberian concept about uh, consumption of goods and pure extractive principles. But it's tied up as well in the whole idea, the concept of, like you know, the social democratic view on what socialism is, you know, where they don't have an eye to reorganizing production relations and they have management relations as their primary focus. Is that just social Democrats though? Because I feel like in the actual history of actually existing actual Marxisms, it oh, sorry, all ends I, up being yeah. that. Well, I mean like the SPD social Democrats and then the Bolshevik counterparts, you know, they both signed up to like red bureaucracy management class kind of socialism. Mm -hmm. One was revolutionary uh, I, and one wasn't. I think I can take a stab at why Weber would think that slaves are a status group. Uh, 
I think it's because he associates status groups with pre-capitalist relations. And this is his way of like saying something similar ish to Marx that even capitalistic slavery is ultimately not that rational for capitalism and that it will be replaced by a market focused class system. Uh, I think that's what he's saying when he's saying that they are a quote unquote status group, which is basically just like they're part of the old order. Um, And I think on that point, like it is a difference with Marx because Marx recognizes the existence of capitalistic slavery, uh, which I think Weber would uh, probably see as just like a remnant as opposed to like an actual germ and core to the development of capitalism. Which many Marxists see slavery as a non-capitalist remnant that needs to turn into capitalism, which of course has, you know, specifically wage labor. Yeah, it's weird because you don't really get capitalism without slavery. So, like, if you actually look at history, so, yeah, the sort of, like, Uno school, ultra abstract version of capital doesn't include it, but actual historical capitalism definitely does. Mason in the chat says that... uh... 55 Weber Economy and Society 928. I presume that's a, I presume there's a oh, page like a footnote. Numbers. Footnote. Um, Can you read the whole thing? Because it's yeah, important. you read it. You read it. There. All right. So Eric Allenwright is citing Economy and Society and says, in Weber's early work on agrarian economies of ancient civilizations, which is marked by a much more Marxian kind of analysis than is his later work in Economy and Society. Slaves were treated as a class, and their relationship to slave owners was treated as involving exploitation. So, okay, Weber coming out of S. Pay Day apparently did have a sort of Marxian view of slavery, at least in his early work, although how you would square that with his later work is an interesting question. So that's like a good amendment. He squared it with his later work in the way that he did. You know, this is the compromise he came up with, right? Slaves are a status group. Yeah, I suppose so. Like, but if you're dropping exploitation, well, maybe that's that's part of his weakness on slavery. It's just like, if you drop the concept of exploitation, like, I mean, you could have objections to slavery on a number of things, but like, it's not <laughs> the, the ruthlessness of owning people and working them like that is... Hmm. Let's just say there's a fucking giant Grand Canyon sized hole in European Marxism from a hundred years ago on things like, you know, the colonies and uh, how they talk about, you know, different peoples. I read the like the Panacox Workers Council. So when he starts talking about like Africa and stuff like that, it's like, Christ almighty, it's pretty dodge. Let's be honest. Yeah. Somebody is the language. You know, some of it is a language and some of it's not the language. So, no, some of it really isn't the language. Some of it's just the assumptions that they're making about other peoples. I will say this is where I will vouch for, you know, a female touch. Um, Luxembourg is the only person who writes about, I mean, some of the language is still 19th, early 20th century sketch, but it, it's way, it takes um, non-European societies way more seriously than uh, almost anybody else until like the 1960s. That probably has something to do with Luxembourg being Polish and Jewish. Um, yeah, that probably has a lot to do with it. Yeah, although that didn't work for Stalin being Georgian, but anyway. Yeah, I think the other thing to say about this this idea of slaves as a status group is that it really fails to come to grips with the idea of slaves as property, which was actually a part of the slavery ideology. Like, because Weber is just treating them as a status group who have a very low consumption level, which is way outside of even the superstructure of what slavery was. That's weird, because he has the notion of private property being important, or, well, I guess that's for capitalism. So, yeah, having this, like, hard modernization framework where, you know, and I mean, look, there is, like, a pretty big break between pre-capitalism in history and capitalism, 
indicated by the fact that I'm fucking calling it pre-capitalism, which isn't like a real category, but it's too trans historical. Like, how do I put it? It's too like historicizing, I suppose. Like there's still some like human economic dynamics that were present before rationalization. I mean, of course, Marxists would say that, right? I, okay. I think, are we good here? To, is there anything else that people want to speak on here on the differences? I think the other part of it is in that um, the status group has the ability to uh, the level at which you can actually interact with the market. I think there's a, there's a bit of that that makes a kind of subjective sense in a way, because that's how most people like understand their economic position. And that's why when people say like middle class, what they mean is having access to uh, markets of commodities at a certain level, because that's most people when they're sort of like understanding their position within the economy, they they're not really thinking about like property or the these kinds of relationships between like the worker and the owner of capital. It's what is their ability to get material things and how what is their relationship to their immediate managers, essentially. And so like there there is a way in which the the actual fundamental reasons why things are the way they are are occluded by the way in which people actually on a day to day basis sort of like interact with the rest of the world. It's commodity fetishism right i i would say it's probably the closest to the way that people look at choosing a major in university based on like which corporate group which class in the Weberian sense will this put me in and what kind of consumption goods will i get out of that as opposed to the like you know fully positional just like Oh yeah, I am this thing. I get this stuff. That's how it works out. Yep, that's why you should never do a philosophy degree, everybody. Okay, <laughs> let's. Yeah, no one's ever done anything meaningful with a philosophy degree. <laughs> Certainly not a PhD. Okay, um, <laughs> the not. I mean, was you, it? you could run half the Asian continent. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, I Who's forgot that? about that. Who? Daddy G? No, Stalin. He was a. Oh, oh wait, no, he was, he was a poet. poet. Never mind. He was a poet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was he's, Varn before he's, Varn. He was in, he was in <laughs> seminary. <laughs> That's why hey, Derek look. writes poetry. It all makes sense. <laughs> Derek was also a religious. Oh, my God. Proto clergy at one time, too. So From Georgia. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my God. George from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Don't God. give me an industrial machine. <laughs> like, Derek, <laughs> what would you say you were going to go into religion? Were you going to be like what? Rabbi? I was a Shramana. I was I was uh I was training to be a Buddhist monk. Holy shit bags. Yeah. Well, right. that's that why, is and were you forced you to do it by your mother? Powers. That's the thing. Were you forced to do it by your mother, Derek? No, it was not, and no. I um, and I, and I no. had a public school education, like a good pro. I wasn't sent to any fancy private Jewish or school or seminary or anything. Yeah, okay. No, that's fair. So we'll let Derek rob the banks for us, but we will not let him touch state power. That's <laughs> so. Don't make me general secretary, or you're all dead. Um, <laughs> so, hey, philosophy degree doesn't sound so bad now, does it? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. Oh, yeah. More differences. Let me read this one here. The empirical prediction that the inner dynamics of capitalism are such that the conditions of class transparency will be progressively strengthened over time, leading to a systemic tendency for long term intensification of class struggles within capitalism. Over the long term trajectory of capitalism, more than in their view. What? What, what have I written here? You're saying like there's this empirical prediction. It will happen over the long-term trajectory of capitalism more than in their views about the conditions within capitalism that are necessary for the emergence of a class-conscious organized working class. So I think you're you're saying right. like 
this is a long-term tendency rather than the organizational conditions that are necessary to get like class consciousness for Weber or become class in itself. So they disagree about the likelihood of the conditions coming about, but they agree on the conditions. Okay. Yeah. Um, and finally, Weber believed the development of capitalism was producing a much more complex class structure, less vulnerable to polarized struggle. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So they're like, this will answer, be answered by history at this point. I think some of the other stuff is much more us able to look at existing class relations and the functions of our society and come down on one side or the other. When it comes down to like this, this is this is the big if for 21st century communists. You know, will we see the reemergence of a class for itself? Are the conditions underway in say developed capitalist countries towards class for itself dynamics or are they going to just be class in itself i will say that for the period that weber is writing about and you know for the period that marx is trying to predict about weber is correct right like it strays quite a bit from the naked class situation that's weber's term for the polarized class struggle and ends up with, you know, a lot of gobbledygook in the middle that make it pretty hard to have a Manichaean sort of class conflict view of the world. In the 21st century, we might see something else, but at least for the period that the thinkers in question are talking about, this is a check in Weber's column. But like, uh, Going kind of slightly against that, would we not say that like even the time of Weber is about that even Germany was like had a huge peasant population? What was the peasant population in Germany around the turn of the century? Was it fifty percent? You know that these dynamics weren't even they weren't even that developed. You know, such that like the proletariat would actually be able on their own to really do stuff. <laughs> Very well. Yeah, but be- Weber isn't talking about the pre-capitalist situation. He's talking about like full capitalism as capitalism configures and reconfigures and, you know, gets its hands yeah. all over society. Marx assumes not just a long run tendency, but something more imminent of proletarianization of liquidating the middle classes. Right. And while I think Marx is probably correct in the long run, you know, for the period of time that they're talking about, uh, Weber's right. Does that make I, sense? Yeah, I, it does make sense. What I would, what I would say is interesting, though, that that we're hitting on is that Weber is still not dealing with the fact that the peasantry was lingering on longer than it should have, and no one seems to have been able to deal with how fast the peasantry seems to dissolve. Like when the peasantry dissolves in a country, it like dissolves seemingly in five years. Give me. Let me give you an example of that. Um, you want to take a place that had a peasantry and still had an industrial center like Italy, right? Southern Italy is still probably 40% peasantry as late as 1970. But between the 70s and 80s, that, or to put it in lefty nerd terms, by the time Operismo started to the time autonomia became a buzzword in, in English-speaking countries, there was no peasantry. In Italy, that's so what, fast. Like the, the, that's the, between the, five and fifteen years. So, like from the fifties. No, from the... nineteen. No, Operismo is a very specific thing that only existed from like nineteen sixty three oh, okay. to like nineteen sixty seven. Yeah, I always forget which decade Operismo is in. You know, right? And then, so like between the beginning of Operismo, which is a very that that window is small. It's like structuralism. There's only like a few years where it matters until it collapses. Right. Where by the time that autonomy becomes studied in English is like, let's say the 80s when like Nagiri runs away from Italian law courts in the France. That's 15 years. The peasantry and everywhere in Southern Italy, but maybe Sicily just completely dissolved. In historical traditions, that's half a generation. That's incredibly fast. Even look at India right now. India had was like 80% peasantry until basically a decade ago. And it's peasantry numbers cut by half 
like every five years. It's incredible how fast that's happening. And that's in a place that's developing historically really slowly compared to like China, where, you know, there's still like, I think there's like 10 or 15% peasantry left in China, but it's, it went down to that very quickly. Tiberius, you want to say something on that? You know more about India than I do. Yeah, I was going to say, so um, my dad's from India. And so we go every couple of years or at least have traditionally. And, uh, you know, starting from about the 90s, like when we would go out and visit all the family and the like who are living out of the immediate sort of uh, urban core of whatever region it's in you're basically going out into a lifestyle that would not have been out of place like a hundred or 200 years ago. And every couple of years, when you go back like that shrank it tremendously, like the amount of people who had been essentially like uh, enclosed off of their lands, who have been drawn into commodity crop production, these kinds of things. Like once you start getting into like, the early 2000s up until like, you know, 2014 or so, that period of mass liberalization in the country just just completely collapsed like the peasant economies, especially in like northern India, places like uh, Punjab and UP. Um, it was tremendous, just like every couple of years you go back and everything seems to be changing dramatically. Like from my, my dad, who was born in the fifties. Um, it was incredibly stable. The sort of like peasant countryside, proletarian city side, that was an incredibly stable situation. Like basically up until the late nineties and early two thousands. Yeah. I think you see that same phenomenon everywhere. Like I think the same happened in Ireland. Like I think when my father was born in the fifties, sorry, mid forties, it would have been quite similar. You'd think Ireland was a dominant peasant country. And then like within 20 years, it's one of those things where people, I think it's like, it's like when people, when they're growing up, they know they're not going to stay on the farm and work on the farm. And then all of a sudden a whole generation will just poof, be gone. It's like, there's just like a structural collapse. 